Welcome. This is the last in our series of five short videos uh, about the regulator uh, of charities, the Charity Commission. Uh, I'm James Sinclair Taylor. I'm one of the partners in the social business uh, and charity team. And I'm going to be talking to Rachel uh, about the key issues that arise uh, in managing conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest are absolutely front and centre of the Charity Commission's concern at present. Um, if you look at the stats, uh, they spend more time dealing with issues arising from this area than any other area, and it's badly misunderstood in the sector. So, Rachel, what do we mean by conflict of interest and conflicts of duty? So, a conflict of interest comes from the area of fiduciary duties, which are a kind of legal duty where you have to act in the best interests of another person or organisation. So, directors, for example, owe fiduciary duties towards their companies, and then trustees of charities owe quite similar fiduciary duties towards their charity and its beneficiaries. So one of those fiduciary duties is the duty of undivided loyalty. So that means that you shouldn't be putting yourself in a position where your own interests could conflict with the interests of your charity. Now, if we look at the Charity Commission's guidance, they have quite a wide definition of what is a conflict of interest. Um, essentially, any situation where there's a possibility that your personal or wider interests could conflict or could influence your decision making when you're acting as a trustee of the charity that's potentially a conflict situation. So in some cases, that might be because there's a material benefit to a trustee, um, and that's considered to be a more serious type of conflict. Um, but the other kind of conflict is where there's no material benefit at all to the trustee, but there's some kind of loyalty or duty that the trustee owes to another person or another organization. And that loyalty prevents them from being able to make decisions only in the best interests of their charity. Now, those types of conflict are considered to be less serious, but they are still conflicts and they still need to be properly managed. The other thing to mention is that as a trustee, it's not just your own interests that matter. It's actually also the interests of people who are connected to you. So, for example, um, you know, any family members, business partners, any company that you own, these are all connected people. So if any of those people has an interest and that interest conflicts with the interests of the charity, then potentially you could be conflicted, even though it's not an interest that you have personally. And I'm, I'm right, aren't I, that the uh, many charities that would be listening to this are actually companies as well as charities. Are there similar duties on them uh, under company law? Yeah, so they are quite similar duties, and it does include the duty to avoid conflicts of interest. Now, what's slightly different with purely companies is that they don't have the same really detailed guidance from the Charity Commission, which kind of has quite high expectations. Um, but if you're a trustee of a charity that is a company, then you need to be aware that there are actually two sets of duties. So there's the duty that you own as a director of a company, and then separately, there's the duty that you own as a trustee of a charity. So can you give me some uh, examples of when a conflict of duty or a conflict of loyalty or, uh, or conflict of interest might arise? Yeah, and so we were talking about this earlier, weren't we, James, about how there's some conflicts that are so obvious that it's, you know, not even probably worth us talking about them too much. So, for example, if you're a trustee and you're being paid by the charity to do something or receiving some other kind of benefit, that's clearly going to be a conflict of interest situation. But the ones that are a bit more tricky and that tend to be more likely to get missed by charities are things like, you know, you're a teacher at a school where your educational charity is going to be doing some work, or you're involved with a local authority or a grant maker that the charity is considering entering into a contract with. Um, you know, you might be on the board of two different organizations that work in the same area, and you hear about something, some certain opportunity from one of those organizations, and then You've also kind of a trustee of this other organization that could also benefit from this opportunity. Um, or, for example, you know, you've there's a contract with your son's employer or another charity that one of your other family members is a trustee of. So those are all the kind of the more tricky situations where there is certainly a risk of a conflict of interest there. But we tend to find that charities are more likely to miss those because they're not quite so obvious. So there are certain situations in which a trustee can benefit. Uh, how does this, what you're talking about, fit with the trustee benefit rules? Yeah, so another fiduciary duty or another part of that fiduciary duty that I was talking about earlier is the no profit rule. So what that means is that as a trustee, you shouldn't be profiting from your role as a trustee of a charity. So 
whenever there's any situation where there's any kind of material benefit to a trustee or someone connected to them, you're going to need authority. So whether that's in your governing document, whether that's by following a certain process in the Charities Act, whether that's maybe approaching the Charity Commission to get consent, you'll need to make sure that that authority is there. And any situation where you're needing to do that, so any situation where a trustee stands to get any kind of personal benefit, that's always going to have a risk of a conflict of interest. So you always need to think about those and manage them carefully. So how do you go about ensuring that you identify all these different uh, sources of potential conflicts of loyalty or conflicts of duty? So I'd say there are four key things. Um, the first thing is training. So however you do that, just making sure that trustees really are aware of what their responsibilities are. The second thing is having a conflicts of interest policy in place that really sets out how to spot conflicts of interest, what to do when they come up. And that's just a really useful resource for the board to refer to whenever they're concerned that there might be a potential conflict situation. The third thing is declaring any interests that you have. So you should really have an annual declaration of interests from each trustee. And that should be coming in front of the board for the board to review what interests there are. You know, if there are any conflicts that arise from that, deciding how those will be managed and also monitoring that throughout the year. And that brings me on to the fourth thing, which is having at the beginning of every board meeting, have a standing agenda item, which is for trustees to consider and declare any interests they have, which could potentially conflict with whatever you're talking about at the meeting or any other issues that have come up since the last meeting. So that's about identifying conflicts of interest. How do you manage them or deal with them? Is it all right to have these conflicts? Yeah, so most conflicts are manageable. Um, it's not the case that you you know, can never ever have an interest in anything else. Otherwise, no one could ever be a trustee. Um, it's more about making sure that you follow a proper process. So the standard way to deal with conflicts is to just recuse yourself. So, you know, leave the meeting, don't take part in, part in the discussions, don't have a vote, don't count towards the quorum, so that you're just completely removing yourself from that situation. Now, there but are some... Can I just say that mm -hmm. I do think that that's so rarely done and so important. I, there seems to be some kind of mental block about people feeling it's unfriendly to ask people to leave the room. Is it, is, is it really necessary to ask people to leave the room? Well, there are some situations where that doesn't have to happen. So it depends what it says in your governing document. It depends what type of organization you are. But where conflicts are considered to be on the less serious end of the scale, you can sometimes authorize those. So the other trustees could say, right, we're going to have a discussion about this ourselves, decide what are the risks here, you know, can we manage this properly? And they could say, okay, well, in this situation, we think the risks are low enough that yes, you can take part in the discussion, but you can't vote. Or, you know, yes, you can vote. Or, you know, they, they can come up with different solutions depending on how they feel the situation warrants it. So that's something to think about. If there is a conflict situation, it's good to be aware of whether you're allowed to do that or not. Um, now, there are some situations on the other side of the scale where actually a conflict is really, really serious and it can't be managed properly. So this is only really going to come up where, you know, it's it's so difficult to be able to demonstrate to the Charity Commission, for example, that you've managed the conflict of interest, that actually you need to consider whether, you know, does that trustee need to resign because actually they can't really participate in, in decision making at all. And to give you an example of the type of situation where that might come up, and this is one from the Charity Commission's guidance, is where your charity is in a really significant dispute with another organisation and one of your trustees also sits on the governing body of that other organisation. Now, that's a really serious conflict, because if this really is significant in the context of your charity, this dispute, then it's hard to see how that trustee can really participate in meetings when this is a really important issue that you're going to be considering. So that's the type of situation where you might need to consider taking extra steps. But most of the time, you know, you can either leave the meeting or consider whether you can kind of authorise that conflict of interest. Right. And, and, I, do, and I think that it's... Um very much the case that while we've been talking about the Charity Commission, there are a lot of other actors who will be watching a charity to see if they're properly managing uh, conflicts of duty, uh, not least the local press. Occasionally people don't like what a charity is doing and being able to latch on to the idea that somebody wasn't entirely um, balanced in the way they made a decision is a very key issue. And I think the Charity Commission guidance is very helpful when it says that you've got to manage a conflict not only if it actually influences um, how another trustee is going to act, 
but whether it might appear to do that to a third party. And one has to think about third parties who perhaps don't have an altogether benign feeling about your charity uh, and manage it with caution. Absolutely. So what about and I think staff? What about staff? Do they, do, do, are, are there issues with conflicts of interest with staff? Yeah, so staff don't have trustee duties, but they do still have duties towards their organisation. So whether that's as a senior manager or whether that's something in their employment contract, they do still have, you know, a certain duty. Um, as trustees, it's really important to make sure that you're confident that decisions are being made properly. So, for example, you want to be sure that the CEO isn't entering into contracts on behalf of the organisation with you know, family and friends. Um, what's really important there is to have proper delegations of authority in place, um, making sure that you've got really clear staff policies so that, you know, you're confident that there are policies in place, but also so that staff know what they should and shouldn't be doing. And because, you know, some of the examples we've talked about already, it's not always obvious. So it's, it's really important to give people guidance about it. Um, and then also things like procurement. So if you do contract a lot, it's good to have some form of procurement policy in place as well. Uh, are there any particular common problems that you see uh, with trustees trying to manage conflicts of interest? So I'd say actually the biggest issue that I come across is just that it hasn't been paid attention to enough. So, you know, the four steps that I was talking about earlier are just really important to make sure that it stays on the agenda and that people are really thinking about it and aware of it. It's really common for, you know, an issue to slip through the net where, so say, for example, a trustee is involved in another charity and there have been lots of decisions taken that relate to that charity and no one's realized that there's that connection, or it might not even be a trustee, it might be one of the trustees' family members is involved at that charity. And because there's not been a declaration of interests, or if there has, no one's looked at it recently, no one realized at the time. And then suddenly you find yourself in a position later on where decisions are being challenged because, you know, should that trustee have taken part in those decisions? And that's a really tricky situation that charities unfortunately do sometimes get stuck in. So it is really important to have those four key steps um, and just make sure that you're not falling on the wrong side of the rules just because it didn't get thought about or, or someone missed something at the time. Well, thank you. That was really helpful. And I think it's important, given the centrality of these concerns with the Charity Commission, uh, that these are really thought through, but also because of the centrality of these concerns with the media uh, and with other uh, stakeholders of a charity. So, um, and thank you for your help in this series. Good Thanks, night, James. Everyone.